Good afternoon and welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs. It's a great pleasure to welcome back one of the executive members of the uh, European Central Bank to speak again with us and the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. So our speakers today are Frank Elderson, who's, who is, as I said, a member of the Executive Board of the Government Council, and uh, he's Vice Chair of the ECB Supervisory Board, who oversees the ECB's legal services. Sharon Donnery is Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland for Financial Regulation, and she's also a member of the Supervisory Board of the European Central Bank and the General Board of the European Systemic Risk a system, as we were bored, as we were saying earlier, the uh, structures of the central banking system in Europe are a little bit complicated, um, but very good to have you both. So today's event, uh, Frank is going to speak for about 20 minutes, mostly focusing on how climate related issues affect the, uh, the, the role of the uh, central bank and the supervisory functions, uh, and Sharon will also give a response and we'll be open to questions. Uh, most of our participants today are online, so we will take questions from those online, uh, And uh, but we will be giving preference to people who have questions in here in the in-person audience. So with that, Frank, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and welcome also on my part here. And um, to the um, Institute of International uh, European Affairs um, for inviting me, and also uh, to uh, the great, uh, great to be here with you, uh, Sharon, uh, on um, uh, on the same stage. So we are living in a period um, of uh, major structural shifts, and um, there, um, and these shifts will be having a profound impact on the functioning of the economy, including the financial system. And therefore, they will also have an impact on our work, uh, our work as central banks and as supervisors. And besides giving you today an overview of um, you know, some of these challenges, some of these major challenges uh, that we are uh, identifying um, and identifying also their profound implication uh, that they have for price stability uh, and for the soundness and resilience of banks, um, I will um, also take the opportunity um, to present to you in more detail um, how we tackle such challenges by focusing on one of them. Um, time will not allow to go into all the challenges. Um, and um, take you, if you like, a little bit on a deep dive uh, in our climate and nature uh, related work. Um, now, before I do that, um, let me give you a little bit of bird's eye view of the major challenges that we, that we see. And after a series of unprecedented shocks, uh, including the pandemic, uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, uh, and the energy crisis, um, triggering inflation that was way too high for way too long, uh, we are now expecting that inflation will converge back to our 2% objective in the second half of 2025. And the increase in ECB policy rates between July 2022 and September 23 um, has contributed significantly to this process of disinflation. And based on the prevailing inflation outlook, it was appropriate to moderate the degree of monetary policy restriction by lowering policy rates with 25 basis points in June and in September. Yet looking ahead, there is no room for complacency. The economy remains subject to significant, several significant transformational structural shifts, including changes to the geopolitical environment, as all of you know, a rapid technical, technological development and the ongoing climate and nature crises. As was underlined by President Lagarde um, in a speech uh, recently, the effectiveness, the effectiveness of monetary policy is intrinsically linked to the evolving structure of the economy. We must be ready for change and be prepared to use the flexibility in our frameworks as necessary. And this is both relevant for our monetary policy objective and for the objectives of um, our banking supervisory role. So you will not be surprised that um, these big structural macro financial themes are also very much reflected and that you see here on this slide 
in our multi-annual priorities for ECB banking supervision that you see here. And I'll highlight some of them just for your convenience. So you'll see them there uh, highlighted. And as a member of the executive board, and you know the chair today already said that, um, and vice chair of the supervisory board, uh, I'm involved in both the monetary policy and banking and supervision responsibilities of the European Central Bank. So let me, as I said, um, take the opportunity to dive um, in one of the common challenges that we identify uh, and present here uh, under both pillars of our institution, uh, the central bank side and the supervisory side, um, and talk about how we take that into account, um, uh, how we take into account the climate and nature uh, crises. Now, to avoid any doubt, let me just make clear one thing before I really dive into this, and we dive into this together. We are not climate and policy makers. Um, it is elected officials who make climate policies, who sign the Paris Agreement, who agree on the European climate law, who um, uh, agree on a fit for 55 uh, action plan, who uh, legislate the nature re restoration law, et cetera, et cetera. That is not us. We are climate and policy takers, not makers. However, when we pursue our monetary uh, policy um, objectives, our price stability objective, and the objective of safe and sound banks, we do look, um, sometimes I put it in this way, we do look out the window and we see what is happening. We see what is happening in terms of climate change and we see what is happening in terms of how governments react um, by having climate and nature policies. Now, when it comes to global heating and um, nature destruction, central banks and supervisors um, can no longer ignore what is happening out there. And that is why we have a role to play. Because, and I think this is key, um, and here you see how we normally uh, think about this, by the way, physical risks, both in a chronic and an acute way, and transition risks, the physical risks, the, the floods, the droughts, the wildfires, um, 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 and um, uh, the transition risks, the reactions that governments, and by the way, also consumer preferences have uh, to, to that. Both are um, drivers of risks, um, and um, many of those financial risks, and therefore relevant for us as a central bank and supervisor. Um, actually, um, I would go as far as to say that it is not just um, a question of is it beyond our mandate to actually look at this and my clear answer to that is no it is squarely within our mandate because of the reasons I just mentioned but I would go as far as to say that us not looking at the effects of climate and nature destruction um, were to be under delivering on our mandate so there are at least five specific macro financial transmission channels from climate and nature related risks, why central banks and supervisors take interest. And I've summarized them here on this slide. Now, for the sake of time, I will not go into them separately and only underlying their main conclusion. Um, these are all reasons why the objectives of monetary policy and banking supervision benefit from an orderly transition relative to a disorderly or a no transition scenario at all. Actually, the ECB has done a macro stress test um, some, some years ago uh, with a very clear outcome uh, being that uh, kicking the can down the road uh, will only make uh, things uh, more volatile uh, economically, uh, in the end, more costly. Um, so an orderly transition is much to be preferred from an economic point of view. Now, through these transmission channels that I just showed, uh, climate and nature-related risks impact all our tasks and uh, responsibilities. As I said, our price objective stability, uh, objective, our price stability objective, I should say, the financial risks, um, uh, exposures on our own balance sheet, not to forget, um, but also the safety and soundness of individual banking institutions and the stability and soundness of the financial system as a whole. Now, 
this is why we ex assess across all our tasks and responsibilities how to incorporate climate and nature related considerations, not just to the extent that we can do so, but as I said earlier, um, also to the extent that our mandate requires us to do so. We have to look at how banks manage all their material risks uh, in as far as climate and nature related risks are material. Um, we cannot afford to not look at them. So let's first look a little bit closer at um, how we are doing this in the realm of monetary policy. Um, as you know, um, we have both a primary and a secondary objective, yeah. and climate and nature are relevant for both. In the context of our primary mandate, it is first and foremost about assessing the risks to price stability. Now, recent research by the European Central Bank, for example, how heat waves impact food price inflation uh, and um, how um, heat waves can cause upside risks to inflation um, is something that we now increasingly take into consideration. And you will also see in our monetary policy statements explicit references to that. Um, at the same time, accounting for climate and nature is important for the management of our financial risk exposures. If it is not necessary from a price stability perspective to actively increase our exposures to climate and nature risks, we should avoid such risks. Now, in addition, there is our secondary objective, which says it is about to support without prejudice to the primary objective, so without prejudice to the primary objective of price stability, it says in the treaty that we shall support, which is a legal obligation, we shall support the general economic policies in the EU. And these general economic policies include the EU's climate objective as transposed in the EU climate law, which I already mentioned, and several complementary pieces of legislation, regulation, and policy. Now, back in 2021, we acknowledged the relevance of climate change for monetary policy by explicitly including um, this um, in our monetary policy strategy. And at the time, uh, we announced an action plan, an action plan with concrete steps to incorporate climate change considerations in our monetary, monetary policy framework. And this action plan, so again, this is, we are talking 2021, this action plan covered all elements of our monetary policy tasks, including our monetary policy operations, macroeconomic and financial analysis, risk assessment, and data collection. Sorry, somebody is doing this, and I think it is... So one year after the conclusion of our strategy review, uh, we announced a number of concrete actions, most of, being, most of which have actually been implemented in the meantime. Um, and at the same time, we have made a commitment, a commitment to regularly review all our measures uh, to assess their, their, their impact. And if necessary, we will adapt uh, these measures to ensure that they continue to fulfill their monetary policy objectives and support the decarbonization path to reach the goals set by the Paris Agreement and the EU climate neutrality objectives. Moreover, we will also look into addressing additional environmental challenges within our mandate. Now, before moving... Sorry for this. I want to go here. Uh, um, to the work um, we will pursue in the next years, let me give you an overview of what we have been doing on this other leg of what the ECB now is since 10 years, and that is European banking supervision. So here, um, what we did was create a roadmap. Sorry for this. Here we go. 
uh, by publishing in 2020 a guide with expectations, um, supervisory expectations on how banks should manage climate related and environmental risk. And this was based on conversations that we had with the banks in 2019, so the year before, where it became apparent that less than 25% of the banks under our supervision, so then you have to think about, um, you know, about the 110 uh, biggest banks uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, less than 25% of these banks had given serious thought to um, um, uh, climate and nature related risks. Uh, and at the time there was already a, I would maybe say still a nascent um, um, international consensus uh, that climate and nature related risks are actually sources of financial risk and therefore need to be managed adequately by banks like any other material risk. So we didn't think that less than 25% of the banks actually having done at least some work uh, in this field was acceptable. So that's why we devised this longer term strategy and we came up with this uh, guide of supervisory expectation. Actually, I'll take you a little bit more to these steps, but the broader tale is that we have used the last years to make sure that all the banks under our supervision actually um, get to the point that they are fully compliant with these expectations. So um, when we came uh, with this guide, uh, sorry, I'm going too fast. Um, we just didn't just invent things, but we build on work that was already had already been done in an international um, context. Uh, in 2017, central banks and supervisors around the world came together in what is called the Central Bank and Supervisors Network for Green the Financial System, the NGFS, Network for Green the Financial System. I was the first chair of this uh, network. And there, um, there was um, already work being done and there was actually an NGFS guide on how uh, banks uh, could manage these risks and how supervisors could actually then supervise how banks manage these risks. And when in the ECB, uh, we devised our own guide uh, that was uh, largely um, or to a great extent benefiting from that work that was already being done informally in that network that I just described. And it's not the end of the story because actually the Basel Committee uh, in 2022, uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision published also their guide, uh, which then of course, unlike the SSM guide, which has logically um, uh, as a parameter, the SSM, but the Basel uh, Committee uh, published a guide which has uh, you know, worldwide application uh, on how to manage and how to supervise uh, climate-related risk. And this was in 2020. Now, also here, as I said before, we are not climate and policy, uh, climate and nature policy makers. Also here, we don't tell banks uh, to whom to lend and to whom not to lend. That's not our role. Um, so our expectations are about ensuring that climate and, and, and nature-related risks are adequately managed by banks, uh, just like banks are accustomed uh, to managing any uh, material risks. Um, so in that sense, there is nothing, nothing new. Um, the categorization of supervisory expectations that you see here on the on the on the slide uh, are categories that are very recognizable for banks and for risk managers, uh, also in other areas. So then um, we devised this broader strategy and I will take you through that uh, quickly. Um, but we first asked the banks to do a self-assessment. So we said, could you please check where you stand today vis-a-vis -vis these expectations that we have published in the guide in 2020. And since we asked them in 21, um, you know, there was still quite a lot of work to do and banks have been very honest and forthcoming to us and I know for sure because they were very self-critical at the time. So they said there's quite a gap between what you expect here from us and where we stand today. Um, and we said, okay, that's fine. We didn't publish this, this guy uh, 20 years ago. It was last year. So we asked the banks to come up with concrete action plans. And when I said the banks, I mean, again, the uh, say 110 uh, significant institutions that are under our direct supervision. Uh, and we asked them to come up with action plans, how to come from their, their A, if you like, to our B. Um, and we also asked how long will this take? And banks said more, you know, by and large, 80% of the banks says, you know, give us to the end of 2023 and we will get this done. 
And then we said, okay, you know, we are going to be, uh, we are going to be reasonable, and we are going to give the banks one more year. Uh, and uh, but we will then uh, indeed expect that all these expectations, as uh, laid down in the guide, are going to be complied with by the end of 24. So one year later, then 80% of the banks had said that they could do. Um, but we said, but we will make sure that that then happens. Then in 2020, uh, two, sorry, this clicker is a little bit too complicated for me. Uh, apologies. Uh, we did a thematic review because, of course, we are supervisors, so we don't just, um, you know, base ourselves on self-assessment by banks. We also go in. We thought this was a new but important and material um, um, risk driver. Uh, so we said we look at all the banks. We did a thematic review. That's the way we call this. this is our term of art, but it's a horizontal review where we actually went to uh, all the banks and we checked and we said, okay, there is progress being made vis-a-vis -vis the situation in 2019, the situation in 20. So that's good news. But the speed of progress is not um, high enough. So if you extrapolated in 2020 with that speed, we would not have had uh, all banks be in compliance with our expectation by the end of 24. So we said, okay, what we will do, we will set a number of interim deadlines and we will enforce those. And that is what we have been doing. Uh, so you will see there uh, some other things. We did a, a climate risk stress test. We did deep dives uh, on real estate. So there have been other things, but I will not bore you with all the details. Uh, but the broader strategy was this. We set a number of interim deadlines, and we will enforce these interim deadlines. And also there, we want to be proportionate. So the first interim deadline, actually what banks needed to do there was to sell a, a, a materiality assessment which is actually a very basic first step in any risk management, is that you try to find out whether, you know, the risks that you are looking at are material, which means that you have to look at your, your balance sheet, your activities, the products that you have, the geographies where you are, where you are active. Um, and what we, what we saw um, is that a number of banks, uh, even in 23, so quite some years later already, uh, had not yet progressed to the point that they had done that materiality assessment in a sound way. So some banks, of course, some had done that, but others, uh, a number, um, had done uh, maybe just some geographies, but not all, or some of their products, but not all, uh, or just looked at physical risk, but not at transition risk, or the other way around. Um, so that is where uh, we have been uh, more forceful. Um, let me go a little bit quicker through my slides here. So, so indeed, um, as I said here, you will see actually all that by the end of 24 would be nice if all that were green. Uh, this was the situation in 2022 where we said, okay, there, the glass is filling, but it's not yet half full. Uh, banks need to do more. Uh, and, um, um, and that's when we started setting these interim deadlines and enforcing them because that is actually, um, um, what we announced and what we are doing and what we are using is an instrument uh, which we call periodic penalty payments. So we have issued a number of um, um, combined decisions is a legal term, but part of that is a uh, the, the possible imposition of a periodic penalty payment, which is actually basically in non-legal terms, uh, um, uh, you know, a formal decision by the supervisor saying that certain things need to be done by a certain date, and if not, uh, in you know every day after that that um, issue is not solved, uh, a penalty is being incurred uh, to a certain maximum, and and that's crucial. Uh, in the end, after you know, a bank of course can go uh, to the court if they don't agree with this, etc. But at the end of the process, if that holds, um, it is being published. Um, now. Of course, as a supervisor, that's maybe also something to point out. Um, we are not driven by the wish to impose periodic penalty payments. This is a means to an end. What we are trying to do is to make sure that banks manage all their material risks. So we are very much aware that we have a privilege um, as a supervisor because we can look, if you like, in the kitchen of all these individual banks, which of course an individual bank cannot uh, because they are their competitors. So what we have been compiling over the years is good practices that we then on a no names basis, but still give back to the sector and say, you know, these are things that we see out there. Um, 
and and you know to encourage uh, but also to facilitate uh, the process it's, there's no need for for each individual uh, bank to reinvent the wheel uh, if they can just learn from wheels that have been invented already um, elsewhere so we've been publishing these, uh, these 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 good practices and over the years also in the future we will continue to do that uh, because in the, the you know again uh, our goal is to just help banks uh, get to the point that they manage this important risk um, risk risk field. And the good thing, by the way, was that already in 2022, uh, we saw examples of each of the expectations already being met at the time, but at least one uh, bank under our supervision. So we had concrete proof that it was possible. Uh, we just didn't see uh, any bank that was fully compliant with all of them. But we saw that, and the interesting thing also at the time was that this was not just about, uh, you know, some big banks uh, or some very, uh, you know, the, the, the small banks maybe, um, being able to do this, but we saw uh, good practices in big and small banks in different jurisdictions, banks of different business models. So we were and are uh, rather convinced that what we are asking is actually, a, um, um, you know, very much doable. I think I went through this already. Maybe to be a little bit more specific, so by the, so the first interim deadline we set was by March 23, um, uh, where we asked these materiality assessments that I talked about. Then the end of 23, we are now in the process of, uh, of assessing the follow-up. Um, and then by the end of this year, uh, so we are approaching that moment, uh, we expect full compliance by all, uh, all, of, the, uh, all of the banks. Um, so also beyond 24, this will still be um, a, um, a priority, um, also because there is new legislation uh, in terms of uh, disclosures, in terms of transition planning. Um, so, um, uh, so we will keep this high, um, high on, on our agenda. Um, and maybe that gives me, and this will be the last part of uh, my introductory uh, remarks here, um, our Climate and Nature Plan 24-25. So here, what we um, um, have uh, decided to do is that we build on what we have done so far, and, um, and we will, uh, we will further further develop this. Here you see an overview of some of the major achievements of the work uh, in the last three to four years uh, that, that we, we have done. I don't know whether you can read all those, but um, it's also on our, our website if you are interested more, more in, in the details, but it is actually to show that there's a wide range of activities that we do, and some of them are really uh, in the very technical realm. So what is the data that we ask? Um, how can we, uh, in the central bank side, how can we uh, and adapt our, um, our mainstay economic models to make sure that uh, climate and nature related aspects are being taken in, uh, into account? So maybe a slightly less, um, um, you know, the, the, the seeable uh, or visible, I should say, um, elements, but very important because it goes into the you know, to, 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 the, to the engine, if you like, uh, of the work uh, that, we, that, we, that we do. Um, this maybe goes a little bit too much into, uh, uh, into detail. Maybe there's one thing in banking supervision that is still interesting maybe also to mention, and that is that we um, also in our fit and proper. So if you become, and then this is of course something that I know that also here in Ireland uh, has uh, gotten a lot of in the, 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 the attention, the fit and proper um, aspects of the work of the supervisor, but also there, there's a guide that we have um, so that people that go through this process know what, what to expect and that banks know what we expect. And many aspects there about diversity, about knowledge, about many things, but also there now we typically ask questions on uh, on people's knowledge uh, on many different uh, risk categories, uh, but also uh, climate and nature uh, related uh, risks. Um, maybe here uh, to be a little bit more um, uh, specific. So the first area of focus, so this is again for the next, uh, the next years, uh, will be on identifying the requirements uh, for the transition and the costs of delaying it. Uh, we will continue to explore 
what the transition means for the economy, including the financial system, and to consider how we can support it within our mandate. In the context of the second focus area, uh, we will invest in improving our assessment of the impact of climate and nature events on the economy, including the financial sector, and this includes work on improving data availability uh, that is crucial for analyses of climate and nature, um, nature risks. And the third focus is about stepping up our work on nature-related risks. So, so far I've been um, uh, talking you know, generally about climate and nature-related risks, uh, but it's maybe uh, interesting to, to explain that um, you know, we have done um, uh, research at the ECB uh, quite, uh, quite uh, broad, where about um, a year ago, we looked at a database that we have with 4.2 million firms in Europe. So not just the big ones, but also uh, the medium sized and smaller, 4.2 million firms. And we asked ourselves the question, to what extent um, is their business model dependent on what we call nature-related services? So think clean water or water in general for cooling purposes or um, for irrigation, uh, pollination, carbon sequestering by forests, um, 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 mangrove forests that, that, that are, you know, a natural um, a protection against uh, shorelines, et cetera. So, so science has defined about 30 or 32 of these nature-related services. And we asked our question, um, do firms depend on those. And the finding, I thought, was very revealing. 75% of firms in Europe are, for their business model, um, to a high extent, de dependent on one or more of these nature-related services. So we take those for granted. Um, and if we knew for sure that these nature-related services were, were stable, then this would not be a cause of concern. But of course, we know that they are in rapid decline. Um, and we went one step further because we didn't just look at these um, these firms, but we also looked at the bank's exposures to these firms. And now that, of course, as we know, uh, Europe is quite a bank-based system, um, maybe unsurprisingly, we found that about the same number, three quarters of bank loans are to firms that are highly dependent for their business model on one or more of these nature-related services. So we will be doing more work um, on this. Um, uh, to, um, to again, bring this in the realm of, of our mandate, understand it better. Uh, and, um, uh, and this is, uh, you know, this, this third part uh, of our focus areas. I have no clock here, but it feels as if 20 minutes have been reached more or less. Um, so thank you. And, and, and I'll be sitting there, but I will be trying to answer questions. So thank you. Good. Um, so just to remind our, our speakers, central bankers, that this is all on the record. It will go on our website. I know you know that, but uh, central bankers, uh, a, a misplaced word can lead to a, lot, to a lot more consequences for central, central bankers than the rest of us. So we might just over the rest of this, three follow-up questions, Frank, if I may, before handing over to Sharon for some thoughts, maybe on matters more domestic. Uh, and then we've got a questions. Uh, those who are online, the earlier you put your questions in, the more likely are, we are to, to cover them. So uh, Frank, my, the first of my questions, um, nobody uh, knows issues of sea levels better than the Dutch. Um, as, a, as, as a Dutchman, um, have you noticed anything in terms of how mortgage issuers and mortgage insurers are behaving and pricing low-lying properties? Um, you know, a 30-year mortgage and, and mortgage insurance for a, 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 for a property that's close to the sea, uh, even a, you know, a small rise in, in sea levels could lead to more frequent flooding. Have, have banks and mortgage insurers um, changed their behavior, changed their pricing? Is there any evidence of that? So this is a very relevant question, and it goes to the core of the things I've been trying to, to hint at. So sound risk management of climate and nature-related risks includes, of course, looking at uh, physical risks. Um, flood risk and sea level rise are clear um, manifestations uh, of these physical risks, flood uh, may be more acute, sea level rise may be more chronic. Um, so within you know my intellectual frame in the in the slide, we are seeing banks um, starting to do this. 
Um, I think we could see more of that, to be honest. Um, but um, the difficulty is, of course, so I don't want to underestimate when I talk about it, you know, uh, you know what banks need to do, uh, make sure that they are in compliance with our expectations in terms of how they have to manage these risks. Um, traditional risk management, to a large extent, of course, is looking backwards and um, and combining data uh, you know, on mortgages over, you know, over many years, many decades, um, and, you know, having models that help you understand these risks. Now, the risk that you mentioned, of course, you know, require forward-looking risk management techniques. You have to, to peer in that foggy future and to try to extrapolate what we are seeing now, listening to climate science, seeing that, you know, these, and, and these things are non-linear. Non um, so it's not easy to do. So what do you do? You work with scenarios um, and you do stress testing. So there are these, these, these more forward-looking risk management techniques. And I'm convinced, and we are seeing evidence of this, but again, I think this is a journey, and we're not at the end of the journey, of banks um, becoming more and more sophisticated um, in understanding these risks, and therefore then also, of course, pricing them. Um, but it's very granular. Um, so, you know, I was told, uh, for example, uh, to take an example, because this is not just in Europe, of course, uh, from Miami, where it really makes a difference whether you uh, finance real estate on one side of the street or the other um, in terms of flood risk. Uh, because it's just, you know, it's like it's three or four feet higher. And that is the difference between, you know, the likelihood of flooding being much, much higher than not. So you need this data. And not just on the zip code, uh, and the, the, but maybe even more granular. Now, there are, of course, an increasing number of external data providers where you can buy this data. Um, so what we are seeing is, I think, a journey where banks become more sophisticated as this. They see this, and we are pushing them, as I said, uh, to make sure that they manage these risks in a very, um, you know, in, in an adequate manner, in a professional manner. Uh, but it sets them up to also reap the benefits from this. Because if you're good at managing these risks, you can, of course, then also take these risks uh, in a controlled manner, in a well-capitalized manner, in a well-managed manner. Uh, and, and let's face it, uh, we should not forget that. Um, um, the whole green transition and the adaptation that is needed to the climate change um, will require trillions and trillions of investment. Um, and part of all that uh, will be financed by banks. Um, so it's not just a defensive story. It is also a story of making sure that you're ready to contribute and to reap the benefits of um, how we, and I mean we as humankind, uh, in the years and decades to come, will grapple with something that we know is there. Good, good. Well, we live in, in pessimistic times, so maybe a, a more upbeat kind of question in terms of a positive scenario around artificial intelligence, which you, you mentioned in your earlier in your presentation as being one of the big changes. Do you folks um, in Frankfurt sort of look at a, a, a productivity surge caused by artificial intelligence uh, that could grow us out of a lot of our problems? Um, is that a scenario that, that you've looked at as an upside risk that we're, we're looking at? Um, and maybe just to bring a sort of central bank element to it, what, what might that mean for equilibrium interest rates? Right. Well, you know, it's, these, are, these, are, you know the, these are very big trends that we are maybe still at the very beginning. Um, uh, so I think that, well, you know, what central banks uh, normally try to do is to, you know, to start, you know, understanding this. Um, I don't think that we are uh, today in a situation where we can give, you know, big projections uh, on, on what all of this means. Um, um, it's very difficult to think that this will not have impact on many things, um, uh, but it's, it's early days. Uh, but it's not early days in terms of us not having taken notice and having, um, um, you know, so we do dedicate resources to, to, to understanding what this all means, but it is, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to. I know, absolutely. And, but it, in, at the, what's your sense? Are you a techno, an AI optimist or pessimist from an economic growth perspective, at least? Well, in, you know, in my job, I've learned that maybe, you know, neither of the two, 
more generally, not just in, in terms of, of technology, is, is there, one has to be very realistic. But realistic sometimes means that uh, you realize that certain developments um, can go very fast. There are tipping points, not just in, 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 you know, in climate, but there are also tipping points in technology. There are tipping points in public opinion. Um, so um, I don't know whether, whether optimism or pessimism are, are very you know, useful um, compasses in the work that we do. Okay. Um, you know, we are skeptical when we, when we supervise. Uh, and we try to be, uh, and you've heard the president say this many times in the press conference, we, we try to be rigorously data-based uh, uh, when, uh, when we chart our way forward in monetary policy and, um, and, and, and data-based. Uh, and, and more generally, of course, it also means science-based. Mm. So, 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 so um, and, and maybe then, the, 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 you know, combining these two things, of course, AI plays a big role also in, in, in climate science. Um, um, we are not climate scientists ourselves, but we listen very carefully to what the IPCC published. We look very clearly at what you know climate science brings brings us, and the message is there. Um, you know, again, I'm I'm thinking about this now because you used the word pessimism and, and optimism. <laughs> also, there, I would not want to use these words, but if one is realistic, the picture is is rather grim. Um, you know, we are presently um, on a 2.93 degree pathway worldwide. That's not, that's not one and a half. It's not two, it's three. That's based on present policies. It's based on the, um, uh, the, the assumption that governments will implement all their stated climate policies in time. That's not, to put it very mildly, a given that that will always happen. Uh, realistically, looking back, it is also not something that has always happened in the past. Um, this three-degree um, pathway does not uh, in, um, include uh, tipping points. Um, so um, science is, in, is relevant. Data is, um, uh, is, 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 is what, what, what is, our, is the basis of what we do. Uh, artificial intelligence will play a role there. But you're asking a little bit too much of me if I can now predict what that all will mean. Okay, look, my, my third question, which we maybe we'll push, we're running short of time. I want to hand over to Sharon, but just, just if we do get to it, it's, it's another tipping point. Have we reached a tipping point in electric vehicles? Um, and in terms of what that means for the auto industry in Europe, are there asymmetric shocks? Uh, around that, clearly the auto industry is based, concentrated in certain parts of Europe. It's a very big industry. And then what does that mean for the financial institutions that support the auto industry? Is that risk, you know, are, could we have an absolute right. catastrophe in the auto industry as, as Europe loses out and, and, and China surges ahead? Is, is that a risk and what might... But look, let's come back to that if we have time. Hand over Sharon for, for her remarks so you can think about that, Frank. Well, All right. If we can get to well, do you encourage it all? So, down or a vet and show you. Uh, hi, everyone. Delighted to be here. Thanks, Dan, and the Institute for having us. Always lovely to be here. Uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us and those who are online, who, of course, don't have the benefit of being in this beautiful building, which I, am, I love coming to. Anyway, I know we're very pressed for time, so maybe I'll just say a few brief things. Um, so, the first thing is to connect the work of the ECB uh, to our work here at the Central Bank of Ireland. So, obviously, we're deeply embedded in the Euro system and the work we do together around monetary policy. Um, and from a banking supervision point of view in the work that Frank has described on many different aspects. But of course, the Central Bank of Ireland also has a much broader mandate, um, having maybe some direct financial stability powers like our mortgage measures, for example, that don't apply to the ECB. And also because we have a wider um, regulation and supervision responsibility for financial services, covering you know, all of the sectors, insurance and funds, etc., um, but also other aspects like consumer protection um, and anti-money laundering. So I think much of what Frank says applies to us, but we also have this maybe broader uh, context to our work as, as well as our domestic focus. And maybe two important things I think that are relevant for Ireland, um, and I'll come back to the shocks or the structural uh, challenges that Frank mentioned. Uh, the 
as we all know here, Ireland is a small open economy and how we're exposed to some of these changes, uh, the structural ones in particular, um, but also the fact that Ireland has a globally oriented financial system. Um, so while we have, of course, important domestic players, much of our financial services sector is actually internationally oriented. Um, so I think the shocks that Frank had on that very nice slide about geopolitical risk, uh, climate and nature related risks um, and digitalization you've just been asking a little bit about that, um, and also to some extent um, demographic which we haven't really touched on today, but is also um, very important. These huge structural changes that are happening are very much on our agenda too, as the Central Bank of Ireland, and particularly looking at Ireland through these lenses of our economy being a small open economy and our globally oriented um, financial services system. And um, because I think, as Frank said, all of these things really are core to our work because ultimately they affect uh, the economy and the financial system. And I think all of those risks and uncertainties um, are really driving uh, much of our thinking, whether it's our economic work or advice to the government, um, et cetera. And you won't be surprised to hear me say that central, I think, to all of these things is the idea of resilience. So whether that's resilience of the public finances, topical in the context of the budget yesterday, the resilience of the banks, the resilience of the wider financial system, the resilience of corporates and small enterprises, um, and also the resilience of households. And I think that idea of building resilience because of these structural changes, and also because we know risks um, can emerge that we haven't necessarily prepared for. So of course, we all thought about pandemics before, but we didn't think it would manifest itself in the way that COVID did. So it really brings home the importance of resilience. And maybe an aspect of resilience, which goes a little bit to your point about AI, uh, Dan, of course, the central bank has been very focused on financial resilience for the last decade rebuilding the financial system after the crisis but operational resilience when you think about digital cyber ai etc i think is much more to the fore in our work at european level but also our work uh, domestically and then my last word is it just about opportunities because i do think there are important opportunities you know central banks often focus on the risks um, and how we need to manage and mitigate them i mean i think for ireland there are opportunities we have obviously a huge tech sector here so in terms of digitalization and the like there are opportunities for from climate, also in terms of you know wind and, and the like um, as Ireland uh, adapts um, in terms of supplying uh, energy. Um, but I suppose from our point of view, it is about getting this balance right between the risks and the opportunities and having that resilience.